I'm Edward Hudgens, Director of Advocacy, and for the last number of years, I've usually given the opening talk, which was good, but it was also, for me, sort of disappointing, But because it used to be that I would come to these things, and I'd be able to sit here, and the first thing I got to hear was David Kelly's thoughts on what's going on, and I always look forward to that, and then suddenly I'm the guy standing up here doing this thing, and so I don't get to hear David uh, giving his thoughts. But I'm going to be on a panel uh, at noon, and I'm going to be giving my sort of closing talk on uh, uh, Saturday, or for, sorry, Sunday. So that leaves the slot open today for David Kelly to speak about the sanction of the victim. As you probably know, uh, David Kelly, uh, who has a degree from Princeton philosophy, founded this organization. Uh, I believe it was uh, 1990 in uh, February in New York City at the Doral, what is it? The the Doral Hotel, yep, yeah. and it's been going strong ever since, uh, f uh, f with you know p promoting open objectivism, the notion that we should actually be rational and not just talk about being rational, and uh, be civil to one another and not declare anyone who disagrees with us on any particular point to be evil and so forth. And other objectivists have come around to this point, and David's waiting for the letter of thanks uh, from other objectivists, but um, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Anyway. Um, and, of course, David is the author of quite a few uh, uh, outstanding books, The Evidence of the Senses uh, uh, on Epistemology. Uh, one of my uh, uh, personal uh, favorites is Unrugged Individualism, where he argues that benevolence should be considered essentially a cardinal value uh, for objectivists. And so if you haven't read that book, you really should. I mean, to me, it's outstanding, one of the best things that David's done. But today, he's going to speak to us about the sanction of the victim. As you know, one of the major themes in Atlas Shrugged and Objectivism is that uh, essentially, people make their own hell uh, by sanctioning their destroyers. And uh, uh, in today's world, this message is even more important than ever. So uh, I'm going to just shut up and turn over the uh, podium to the one you really want to hear, David Kelly. Go ahead, David. Thank you, Ed. I think you're mic'd up. Oh, those are mine. <laughs> no, you have my notes. I do? Oh. Where? Oh, there they right. are. OK. I hate to have to say, well, I, my dog ate my notes on the way over, so I'm just going to talk ex extemporaneously. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, everybody. Um, <clears throat> the central plot device in, in Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged is the strike of the producers. And the idea behind the strike, the rationale and purpose of the strike, is to withdraw what Galt, what Rand calls the sanction of the victim. And that's going to be my topic today. Now, <clears throat> before I get started, uh, Atlas Shrugged is a mystery novel. And this talk is going to be a massive spoiler. Uh, how many people have not read it or haven't finished it yet? OK. <laughs> Just a handful. Well, you know, <clears throat> nor normally um, speakers take a certain umbrage when people get up and leave during a talk. We try not to take it personally. Um, but in this case, I'm going to close my eyes. If you want to wait to see the video um, and not spoil the fun of reading it the first time, I will, um, um, uh, I'm fine with that. Although, you're going to see the movie tonight anyway, so. <clears throat> this would be the sanction of the audience. <laughs> I, yes, I, I think I n will now claim that I have the sanction of the audience. Thank you, Don. <clears throat> All right, in, in, in the course of the narrative through parts one and two of the novel, uh, and even into part three, the protagonists, Dagny Taggart and Hank Ridden, are struggling to understand what's happening in the world. And as they do, they are beginning to get a glimmer of the principle of the sanction of the victim, <clears throat> partly through the help of uh, some mysterious figures who appear from time to time in their lives. So as an introduction, um, I would like to uh, turn the floor briefly over to the second best exponent of the idea. This is a scene from Atlas Rock Part Two, in which Francisco uh, Danconia visits Hank Ridden in his factory office and asks him, why do you stay in business? To make money. Yes, to make money by creating a product that nobody ever dreamed of. And how's that working out for you? It's getting tougher. Did you 
want to see your metal and your wealth used by looters who think it's your duty to produce and theirs to consume? Moochers? Who think they owe you nothing? No wealth, no recognition, no respect? Is that what you wanted? I'd blow up my mouth first. Then why don't you, Mr. Reardon? That time and those people are upon you. If you saw Atlas, giant who holds the world on his shoulders with blood running down his chest knees buckling arms trembling but still trying to hold up the world with a last of his strength what would you tell him to do i don't know what would you tell him to shrug francisco's metaphor of atlas shrugging is a wonderful image for the core principle, and of course it gives the title to the book. What he is asking Reardon and the other producers to do is to shrug off a burden imposed on them by a politically collectivist uh, in intervening system of government and an altruist morality that um, is its foundation. <clears throat> so my goal in this talk is to look uh, at the, the, this principle and also at the strategy, the way in which withdrawing the sanction of the victim is the core strategic point of John Galt's strike. So we're gonna, I'm going to uh, cover three main areas. One is the presentation of the idea from inside the novel. Then we're going to look at some other strategies of social change uh, that will raise some interesting points of comparison. And then we'll come back and look in a little more detail analytically at the premises that uh, lie behind Rand's conception. So we'll start with the way Rand presents the idea in the novel. The sanction of the, of the victim idea is an insight based on her, on a question of why good people are so often exploited by society, why rational and productive people are mistreated by society. Why are people with these life-affirming and life-sustaining virtues expected to support those who lack the virtues? Why are they saddled with interference that, gov that uh, uh, prevents them from acting on their best judgment, ex exploits their talents, expropriates their achievements, and so forth? That's the question that Rand is trying to answer and does so through the person of John Galt. The insight is that the conflict between the productive people and those who are more parasitic on them is rooted in a conflict of values. <clears throat> what makes the producers vulnerable to exploitation is a moral code that regards them as selfish, materialistic, antisocial, which they are by the standards of that code. And the looters, the parasites, use those accusations to justify taking the producer's wealth and abridging their freedom. So until the producers challenge the accusations and the standards they're based on, until they reject the moral code that underlies the accusations, they will carry a burden of unearned guilt that prevents them from standing up for themselves and their rights and their honor with moral confidence. Now, as a consequence of this ethical dilemma or conflict, the producers are saddled in, in the novel, as in increasingly today, real life, by a, a, a host of regulations and controls. <clears throat> Just in the, uh, pick a few of the, of the, of the uh, points that arise in the novel that have um, really significant consequences. There's the dog, anti-doggy dog rule, which drives Dan Conway out of, the California, uh, out of the Colorado train business and puts pressure on Dagny to build the John Gall line. 
That was a, a, a product of scheming on the part of her brother James and uh, Orrin Boyle. And at the same time, or Orrin got the uh, Equalization of Opportunity Bill, which hampered Hank Reardon, forced him to sell off all his businesses except his metal business. At the end of part one, <clears throat> after the successful run of the John Galt line, uh, Wesley Mouch, uh, who's become economic czar, uh, uh, imposes a whole set of, of onerous controls that basically uh, eviscerates the value of having created the, the line in the first place and leads um, Ellis Wyatt to quit. Then in part two, we have the fair share law, which requires Reardon to sell his metal in equal amounts to all comers, regardless of their need, ability to pay, or uh, ability to use the metal. Uh, and then finally, the draconian directive 10 289, which basically turns every, every working person into a serf attached to their jobs, prevents businesses from moving, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so this is what uh, the producers are working under, and it gets worse uh, o over the course of the novel. Atlas Shrugged, in economic terms, is like a um, time-lapse uh, photograph of, of an economy that's in serious decline. It happens faster in the novel than it does in real life, but uh, the process is quite the same. <clears throat> now, these, these measures, like the ones I've mentioned, were imposed by politicians and by their crony capitalist uh, uh, friends who, who have access to the power, <clears throat> who try to gain wealth through political connections and manipulation and exclusion of, of uh, their competitors. <clears throat> and these measures drive the economy ever deeper and deeper into decline over the course of the novel. And they lead one producer after another to quit often mysteriously, someone just vanishes. But it's, it's essential to understand <clears throat> that the strike is not just about political oppression. It is not just about regulation or government or controls. It is fundamentally about the underlying moral code that sustains and quote unquote justifies those controls. The producers live by a code of reason, individualism, the pursuit of their rational self-interest, and trade with other people. For most of them, these premises are just implicit, and they don't stand up to defend them against the altruist morality, uh, the serve your brother, uh, you are your brother's keeper morality, that the looters invoke when they uh, seek control. <clears throat> and that is where John Galt comes in. His strike is not primarily at the beginning about political controls. It occurs when he resigns from the factory where he was working, when the heirs of the man he, who hired him, the man who used to own the company, <clears throat> died and his heirs took over and instituted a new socialist type plan in, in private, but still on a socialist principle of from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Um, on the premise, as spoken here by Gerald Starnes, that, th that each of us now belongs to the other by the law which we all voted for and we all accept. And this is a moral law. He's not talking about legal laws. And Galt says, no, I don't. I don't, <clears throat> I don't accept it. I will put an end to this by stopping the motor of the world. And what is the motor of the world? Well, of course, it includes production and productive efficacy on the part of the producers that he eventually succeeds in leaving, le leading out on strike. But the real motor is the mind the independent individual minds that are being controlled through the process of a morality that doesn't, does not respect individuality and uh, a politics that, that oppresses it. So it's the second element, the moral element, 
the moral rebellion that, that makes this a strike. <clears throat> Galt, is on, Galt is not simply leading the producers away from an oppressive situation to go live by themselves and not be bothered, like some high-tech kind of Amish uh, uh, off in their valley, hidden. No, it's a strike. They intend to change the world. They, they are um, sending a message and making a demand. The message is, we don't recognize the right of anyone to expropriate our wealth and creations or, and saddle us with arbitrary decrees. And we reject the principle that the needs of others give them a right to our time, effort, and achievements. And the demand that makes this a strike, we have withdrawn our material support and moral sanction from a system that makes us victims. We demand the freedom to live and produce in accordance with our own values and our own judgment. In the meantime, we refuse, until you recognize that and permit it, uh, we refuse to continue offering the benefits of our creative achievements. We will live apart, and you will live without victims to loot. Now, I actually took this, <coughs> uh, took this for these formulations from uh, a memo I wrote to a screenwriter, not for the current project, but a previous one, just trying to boil it down to uh, the simplest possible concept. And I think, I still think this is a pretty good um, formulation. So this is the me message that Galt uh, explains to the people he recruits for this strike, and that he will explain to the world in his speech. All right, so now let's move on to <clears throat> an external view. Let's look at how other uh, strategies of social change are, are similar and different from, from Galt's strategy. I want to look at two cases. One is a labor strike, and the other one is um, um, civil disobedience or it, sometimes called passive resistance, nonviolent resistance. Um, there are subtle differences, but it's basically the same concept. So in a labor strike, <clears throat> we have people, workers, walking out saying, we're not going to work anymore until our demands are met. And those demands typically are for higher wages, better working conditions, more autonomy, whatever they might be. <clears throat> And we'll consider in a moment what, exactly what Galt means by this statement uh, when he uh, contrasts what he's doing with a typical labor strike. <clears throat> a, the strike, a labor strike, has a certain strategy. There's a goal, which is formulated and expressed as a demand for better wages and benefits, and the strategy is we stop work. We make our demands known, and we stop working until they're met. And there's a rationale for it. The rationale is that the normal means of getting the conditions we want have not succeeded. They have reached an impasse. They've broken down. We're at loggerheads with the employer. But we think the employer is capable. He's not about to go bankrupt, or there wouldn't be any point to this. We think he's capable of paying more. And we think that the loss of production for him will cost him more in the long run than raising our wages will cost him. That's the, that's the rationale, the strategic analysis that lies behind uh, labor strike, in, in essence. Every strike's a little different. But. And so the rationale and the goal determine what the tactics are going to be. You organize as many workers as you can. You publicize the case in order to win public support. You pick it to discourage non-strikers from going to work. Uh, and there are other less savory things that are involved in some strikes. Uh, but you see there's a logic to this. You have a goal.
to achieve the goal, you set a strategy based on a certain rationale, and that dictates what tactics, what actual um, efforts you make, particular things that you do. So I, I mentioned this not so much because labor strikes are interesting in themselves uh, for our purposes, uh, or that they shed much, much light on Galt's strike, but to show you <coughs> this logical structure. <clears throat> so let's turn on now to, to um, civil disobedience, my second example. The term civil disobedience comes from Henry David Thoreau from an essay that um, came, to, came to have that title. <clears throat> Thoreau, uh, writing in the, I believe it was the 1840s, uh, was deeply opposed to and offended by slavery, including uh, he lived in Massachusetts, which was not a slave state, but he was offended by some of the laws um, that were uh, gave some advantage to slave owners uh, in the South. He, he was also deeply opposed to the Mexican War. And so he refused to pay his taxes. <clears throat> he actually spent a night in jail for that. Uh, until someone paid his taxes for him. Um, but he gave <clears throat> the analysis of <clears throat> uh, disregarding a law, disobeying a law for the purpose of challenging it and forcing the government not to be able to take your compliance for granted and take some action that would uh, bring to the surface the, the issue, the problem, the injustice that you're concerned about. So I don't want to say too much more about Thoreau, uh, but he was a um, very significant influence on the two primary uh, figures in the 20th century who are known for developing and, and acting on the basis of the strategy um, of, of civil disobedience, and that is uh, Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi. So let's take a look. Martin Luther King, the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, is famous, I'm sure all of you know. Uh, he led marches, he uh, organized boycotts in the southern states. Um, he was arrested in uh, a, 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 a march in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, Alabama that turned violent. And uh, he spent a night, at least one night in jail. But I, I quote his statement here um, because it, it is interesting for the purpose of understanding strategies of resistance. <clears throat> Privileged groups rarely give up their privileges without strong resistance. Instead of privilege, we could say power. So the basic question is, how is the struggle against the forces of injustice to be waged? But you could rebel violently, that's a rebellion, that is a kind of strategy of social change, but it's the extreme case. How, short of that, how do you do it? The alternative is to engage in nonviolent protest. It's sometimes called passive resistance. Now, it's not passive is not really an accurate word because you do things. You organize boycotts. You go on marches. You write protest letters. Um, you organize voter drives and so forth. Those are actions, but what you do is make yourself vulnerable to the law in a nonviolent way. You do not use violence in doing any of this in an open fight. And the goal is to, to shame the people who have this power that you're opposing. Your resistance raises the, and makes public and brings to attention the, the moral issue, uh, uh, the injustice, and you, because you believe that this is injustice, as in the case of uh, Southern um, segre or segregation anywhere, uh, enforced segregation against blacks, uh, to make the public not stand up and say, you know, there's, there is something wrong with this. Now, I, there's a, one more point about that, that I want to write, and this is from <clears throat> this is from um, an example from Gandhi, and I'm actually going to show you a, a little clip from the movie Gandhi with Ben Kingsley instead of the real Gandhi because it's he's easier to understand. Um, <clears throat> I, so I won't vouch for the actual the literal, the full historical accuracy of 
of, of this scene in Gandhi's life. Um, but it, it gets across a key idea. This is, uh, uh, before he went to India, he was uh, organizing resistance in South Africa to, law, to a law that, um, uh, that, that applied only to colored people, which in that case meant Indians um, mainly. To, they had to be fingerprinted. They, there were restrictions on their marriage ceremonies that they could use, not their own religion, and so on and so forth. So he's, organized, he's at a meeting now with people who uh, are also upset by this. So let's now hear what he has to say. I say, talk means nothing. Kill off your officials before they disgrace one Indian woman. Then they might think twice about such laws. In that cause, I would be willing to die. <laughs> I praise such courage. I need such courage because in this cause, I too am prepared to die. But my friend, there is no cause for which I am prepared to kill. Whatever they do to us, we will attack no one, kill no one. But we will not give our fingerprints, not one of us. They will imprison us, they will fine us, they will seize our possessions, but they cannot take away our self-respect if we do not give it to them. Have you been to prison? They beat us and torture us. I say that we... I am asking you to fight. To fight against their anger, not to provoke it. We will not strike a blow but we will receive them. And through our pain, we will make them see their injustice. And it will hurt, as all fighting hurts. But we cannot lose. We cannot. They may torture my body, break my bones, even kill me. Then. They will have my dead body, not my obedience. Stirring words. <clears throat> but I think you can see that what Gandhi's speech here is represented in the film uh, adds to the points I've referred to uh, drawn from Martin Luther King is we will be victims. We will expose ourselves to harm, and we will not fight back. <clears throat> and so this strategy has an element of suffering, possibly self-sacrifice. And in the final, <clears throat> final cadence of, of uh, Gandhi's remarks, they're a little bit of a mind-body dichotomy. They can kill my body, but they will not get my obedience, my mind, my soul. So uh, what we have is um, a strategy that ha to which we can apply the same logic as with a labor strike. We disobey the law. We're trying to, the, the goal and the demand is to change an unjust law, like having to fingerprint one class of people. And <clears throat> we do that by publicly, publicly disobeying the law. On the ra rationale, at least in part, that lawful means of change, elections, negotiations, legislation, these have not succeeded. <clears throat> if we disobey the law, however, we bring to the fore, to the public mind, the issue of justice or injustice. <clears throat> and we actually create a dilemma for the authorities because now they have to choose whether they yield to our protest, which means we win, or they engage in brutality, suppress the protest, which will almost inevitably require um, violent means, and then they will uh, shame themselves and they will awaken public outrage. That is the strategy. And that's why that leads to tactics like 
picking a certain action like boycotting or sitting in at a segregated lunch counter um, or, or refusing to go, have your fingers, um, yourself fingerprinted. You organize as many people as possible to raise the stakes against the authorities. You provoke them to overreact and you become victims. And hopefully this will gain public sympathy and support. So you see that there is a certain structure to these strategies. There's something we want, and that something almost always has a moral dimension. Even in a labor strike, although it's mostly about material benefits and working conditions, there's all, usually an element of we deserve better. <clears throat> there's a strategy based on some kind of rationale uh, that then dictates what tactics we employ. And that rationale across these different cases have three elements. One is the ordinary means of change have not worked. Secondly, there is a moral issue and we want to make that, we want to highlight that, we want to bring that to public attention. But we're not, we can't succeed just by moral suasion. It, we ha it has to be by, um, we have to create some incentive for the people we're, whose behavior we're trying to change. There has to be an incentive along with the moral case. Okay, and that leads us back to um, Galt strike. <clears throat> Shortly after Dagny crashes in the valley and is talking with Galt, she says, that night, 12 years ago, that's, that story is true, right? Not the Atlantis thing, not the other, some of the other myths. Yes. You told him you'd stop the motor of the world. How? I have. What have you done? And here's the money line. I have done nothing, Miss Taggart. I have done nothing. And that's the whole of my secret. Now, what does Galt mean by that? Of course, that's not literally true. He's done a lot. I mean, he recruited all these guys um, to set up the strike. But what he means, I think, <clears throat> is he has simply stopped functioning as a, the creative genius that he is. He has simply stopped. <clears throat> and in that sense, <clears throat> he is doing nothing. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is getting slightly ragged. <clears throat> yes, I do, have, I do have water here. Now, Galt's statement has something like, uh, a, a, a ring of something like the strategy of passive resistance, because he's saying, well, I'm not going out and, and engaging in guerrilla warfare. And actually, I, uh, if I had more time, I would tell you sad stories about the history of trying to make Alice Rugg, where the, some of the directors and screenwriters uh, prior to the current project really wanted a little more action um, and had people blowing up buildings and all that stuff. Um, I, and I, I had to keep using this line. No, that's not what it's about. <clears throat> so we have a goal. Galt's, uh, what Galt is trying to do is to change a, the society's political culture, political structure, from a basically collectivist system to an individualist one. And He's demanding a change in the culture, the moral culture, from one that's based on mysticism and altruism to one that's based on reason and egoism. Now, that's a pretty large goal. Right? But, I mean, by comparison with trying to end segregation in Alabama, which is itself a pretty large goal um, and pretty heroic thing to have done, but um, this is on a va much faster s scale. <clears throat> and the strategy is to remove the producers who embrace reason and egoism and desire their freedom on the rationale that is based on a principle, the impotence of evil. The mystical, altruist, collectivist philosophy, mindset, worldview, is not compatible with actual productive success, not compatible indeed with life itself. It is sustained only by the implicit sanction of the uh, producers 
A sanction that has two aspects. One, they continue working within the system and are therefore giving it moral uh, material support. And secondly, they're failing to challenge the premises under which they are being oppressed. And so they are implicitly lending their moral sanction. Take away the sanction, the system will collapse. People, uh, the society, and this is the incentive part of Galt's strategy, <clears throat> without the producers, so the, the economy will decline, people will become poorer and poorer, uh, and until the point comes when uh, people realize that what, what it is that the producers do and why they're important and why productive achievement is an important driver and is, should be considered the thing that we protect rather than the thing that we try to suppress. And that rationale leads to the basic tactics that are uh, worked through in the novel. Uh, first of all, convince the pr producers to strike. So as more and more people leave uh, the economy and withdraw with call, <clears throat> the more impoverished the economy becomes, and th therefore the, the fewer benefits that are being created and traded and um, flowing to the, the people with whom the producers would ordinarily be happy to trade and shower their benefits on. That's the material part of the withdrawal of the sanction. <clears throat> the moral part, though, has to be in the form of some announcement. I mean, if people are just disappearing, and that's it, and the economy is getting, you know, going into the tank, well, why? No one will have a reason to change until they know why this is happening. And so the strategy of the strike and the part of the brilliance of the plot of Atlas Shrugged is at the moment when no one can miss the disaster, the train wreck that is happening around them, Galt comes out and says, Here's what is happening, here's what I did, here's why I did it, join me. If you don't join me, you will never succeed. You, you, he, he issues his demands at the point where the incentive to accept them is at its highest because people are desperate. <clears throat> <clears throat> but to do that, to, to recruit his people, there are a couple of important sub -tac uh, uh, tactics that he needs. First of all, he, to convince the, the, the producers, he has to convince them that they're complicit. They are complicit. They, they are giving their sanction by continuing to work. That's what the scene with Francisco and Ridden was all about. Francisco was saying, why do you continue to work when you get no respect and you, your wealth is being expropriated? Why don't you shrug? And finally, Ridden says, yeah, you know, <laughs> That's right, I can't, I can't do this anymore, not just because I hate going to work in the morning um, and dealing with uh, the regulators, but because um, I'm sustaining an evil system. And then he also has to overcome the generosity of the producers who cannot conceive of the kind of hatred of the good and resentment that uh, motivates a lot of the altruism. Um, that's an important point that I think we could uh, a lot more time talking about, but I won't. <clears throat> um, I want to end with just one, um, <clears throat> a few, a few last points here. The I wanted to say a word since this, this is all about sanction. Um, there is a phenomenon within the objectivist movement that I think of as sanction mania, <clears throat> um, where it's not just the mystic altruist collectivist uh, axis that is the target, but people who read certain books or. Um, fraternized with certain people are, <clears throat> are regarded as um, uh, needing sanction. We'll have uh, plenty of opportunity to talk about that Sunday at lunch with um, David Harriman and myself and, and Jay LuPere. I want to say one word about um, the, uh, this next point about going gold, <clears throat> especially since 2008 with the, when our economy went into serious decline. People actually began using that phrase. Um, Ed, uh, Hudgens wrote uh, uh, at least one piece about that. And one thing I would say is it's perfectly reasonable for people to retire early or 
to scale back their efforts. And uh, if and when they do, uh, they should, to the extent that it's driven by, I don't want to work within the system anymore, I do not approve, that they announce their moral disapproval as well as withdrawing their productive abilities. But please remember that Atlas Shrugged is a science fiction story. The idea that one guy would go out and convince a couple hundred people to go off to a valley and that this would cause the world to crash. Ayn Rand herself described this as the fantastic premise of the prime movers going on strike. And she was using the word fantastic not to mean uh, cool or super. Uh, she meant other pertaining to a fantasy. I, one of the great achievements, uh, one of her great achievements as a novel is that she made it so real and gripping, this extraordinary, impossible thing. But we're not going to go galt, really. What we can do, though, is always maintain the moral high ground. Uh, and never, ever let those who would impose the kinds of values or controls that Atlas was all about without protest on moral grounds as well as economic and any others. So thank you. I'm sorry I went a bit over, but I think we have time for questions. Yeah. Yes? Okay, okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, <clears throat> we, do have, um, okay. we do have time for questions. There's a microphone here, and since we're recording, if you go up to the microphone uh, over here, uh, we would appreciate it. And David, you want to just go ahead and field the questions uh, sure. yourself? And make them in the form of a question as opposed to a John Galt speech. <laughs> Hi, uh, is this on? Can people hear me okay? Yeah. Um, you mentioned it, it would be fantastic if something like this occurred. It was a fantasy. But if I said to you, seven or eight brilliant people disappeared from Poland, from Germany, from Italy, from Russia over a seven year period, no one knows what happened to them. Then, August 8th, 1945, the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. And what it was is you had these brilliant Manhattan scientists who pulled John Galtz. They left their countries of statism to escape that, do medieval, jo uh, medieval jobs and so forth too, until they had that critical mass of minds at Princeton and elsewhere. And when Meitner indicated that the atom could be uh, split, it started the chain reaction that by 1946 there were 44,000 free minds working on the bomb that changed the world. Uh, America may have been gul gulch at that point. And those okay. people who drew the, so what's your thoughts on that? Uh that's a very interesting example, and I, I do take your point that uh, brilliant people and uh, dedicated people can achieve extraordinary things. Uh, and, in, and in the case of a wartime situation where the military capacity that the, the atomic bomb gave to the, to the U.S. Uh, had big consequences on liberating other, uh, other parts of the world, too. That's, that's one of the things that can happen in, in war. But war, states are good at wars because you have a specific purpose and you, you recruit the means to it and you have to, you have to plan and allocate the way uh, you would do it for any project. But trying to control an economy is a very different thing because in that case you have people with all different purposes trying to live their lives. And you, those people, when one thing happens, they will react and, and try something else if they're blocked. Uh, you, that's why the government can do things like put a man on the moon, but it can't solve the problem, the problem so-called of, pro of poverty. <clears throat> because they're, they're, 
a moonshot or uh, a war is a very specific goal, purpose to which you can, from, from which you can derive what means we have to employ. But as free market economists uh, from Hayek and von Mises and many, many others have said, you can't try to control an economy. Uh, and you can't undo controls because every control has vested interests. And so you're dealing with a complex system that is not a single project, but millions and millions of in individual projects. So I think there's a fundamental difference there. Thank you for that brilliant, brilliant presentation, David. Um, I wanted to just mention the word sanction is confusing because it means two opposite things. <laughs> and in your case, of course, this case means the acceptance or approval or even the surrender. Whereas the way these days sanctions are used are to condemn, to disapprove, to stymie. So we need to somehow make it very clear which sanction is being talked about. Because we're putting sanctions on every country on earth for various political reasons. Right. And that is the opposite meaning. Could yep. you kind of elucidate on that? Exactly. That's a very good point, Kate. And, um, that's very true. So, uh, <clears throat> I would, I, I, in, a, in a less educated uh, audience, I would have to take time to act, explain that. But, um, but it is important, I, and there's probably some interesting logical reason why that word has the um, bivalent um, uh, content that it does. I don't know. Anyone else? Uh, Nira. Uh, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. I loved your comparison of the Atlas strike with other kinds of strikes. Thank you. But I just wanted to say uh, that it, there's really no mind-body dichotomy in the thought that the state can have my body but not my obedience. If the state kills me because I refuse to obey, then it's true they have my body, and it's true they never had my obedience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and Rand herself has... Uh, uh, that kind of uh, character in Anthem. You remember the martyr who's burned at the stake. Well, they never had his obedience, but they were left with his body. Right. So I just wanted to, uh, I thought that was um, That was a stretch. I, I, I will uh, I agree that that was uh, kind of a stretch. Um, I think it was probably true in, in light of Gandhi's religious beliefs. But I don't think it, I, I take your point. And in, in Atlas Shrugged, um, there are, um, there certainly are cases where people similarly expose them. Uh, Galt, of course, um, to, to the highest degree yeah. at the end. Although that's not really for the sake of the strike. Right. But also in the, in the South African case and then later in India, Gandhi didn't think that he was being a victim. He, he thought, you know, he thought of himself as the mover and shaker by resisting their uh, wrong, their immoral orders. He was going to show them at their worst, and that would gain him public sympathy. And in fact, it would appeal to the best in them. Right? It would appeal mm -hmm. to the best in the British, uh, in the latter case, in the Dutch, and the former case. Well, I think that is the, the point you, you hope for. You push the people to, to be on better behavior, <laughs> uh, and to see the point of uh, the, the rectitude and justice of, of, of your demand and, yeah. or complaint. Um, you, you know much more about Gandhi's actual history and what happened there. Uh, I was just struck by the re yeah. <laughs> representation in the film. Yeah, but uh, I, I thought the, something really important about the, uh, Gandhi's passive resistance and I uh, assume Luke, Martin Luther King's is that they're appealing to the best mm -hmm. in those who are oppressing them, right? Not to their worst. Okay, thank you. Other uh, questions? So it seems to me, um, from a practical point of view, the closest that people have to doing galting historically is when most of the productive people emigrate for a, from a country. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be, to be the, pra and I'm interested in your thoughts on that anyway. Well, that, that is an interesting example. And I don't mean to discourage, I don't mean to deny that th things somewhat similar or in the same direction uh, can happen. 
like the, um, there was a pretty steady flow of doctors from Canada to the U.S. I don't know if it's still going on, but um, I know a lot of them came to the U.S. because they, they didn't like operating um, under the constraints and fee limitations in uh, Canadian healthcare. Though, uh, farther back, there were, there was a lot of talk about uh, the brain drain from England because of their taxes were so much higher. And um, so I, I'm sure that this is a factor. And to the extent that it, it is understood and known, uh, just as a purely economic phenomenon, it creates incentives for governments um, not to create conditions that cause uh, productive people or productive companies to flee. So um, in purely economic terms, yes, I think that phenomenon is uh, real and, and important. I don't know how many people, however, w who are part of any such movement are standing up and saying, this is wrong. You know, I, was it Mick, ja Mick Jagger who uh, uh, left Britain because he didn't want to pay 90 some percent of uh, his fabulous Rolling Stone wealth. And actually, I think he said something kind of, kind of good, didn't he? Does anyone remember? He said, he said something just with a, at least a little bit, and a little bit coming from him, a little bit of a moral edge, which coming from him is a lot, um, about, about the conditions he was fleeing. So anyway, but most, I, that is much less common, in my experience, watching the world, than the purely economic uh, flight of capital and talent. And okay. Anybody else? We have a couple. We still have another minute or two. I'll, I'll just ask, want make, ask one question or make a point that David um, Gandhi uh, supposedly. I can't remember whether I actually read this letter or just a summary of it, but uh, when Jews in Germany in the 30s asked Gandhi, well, what do you, how do you suggest we act? And he said, sort of similar to what he was doing in India. The point is that Gandhi in India was assuming the British had certain moral premises that mm. they were being hypocritical about and trying to force them to, hey, are you going to be consistent or not? Whereas passive resistance in Nazi Germany would simply have meant oh good, we can exterminate you easier. And in that sense, it wasn't passive resistance. It, sometimes you actually have to take up guns and kill people because otherwise they're going to kill you. So I think that kind of uh, getting to your uh, point yeah, about the context of this. That relates to your point. And your point yeah, too, yeah. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. And that, that actually, that transition happens in Atlas. Uh, in, in part one of Atlas, the, the society is pretty much kind of like a... Um, a like our society, a little further along the road to serfdom. <laughs> uh, some more, but you know, uh, they can't, they, the government's not willing just to expropriate Rudin's wealth. They gotta get him to sign, sign a certificate to, or, or engage in a sale. Um, there's still some free speech. But by the time we get to, um, in, into the middle of part three, which we'll be seeing tonight, uh, it, it really is a, to, become totalitarian or so authoritarian that no, there are no rights, essentially. No, no, no one has any protection from rights. Power is unlimited. And so in that case, you know, if, if Galt, after his speech, doesn't recruit enough guys, people to join, to join him, well, it, it may be, you know, the strikers may have to go to war. That well, actually, will be part four. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, well, uh, thank you, David, for an excellent talk. I'm glad I got to actually listen to it. Uh, I'm supposed to make it. And um, everybody, we're going on a break. Uh, but before that, please thank David for his uh, talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you.